that old saying that those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. Well, nobody wants to repeat anything like the Great Depression. But there is a precious lesson those desperate days in our history has taught us. It was a time when Americans forgot their differences and came together, like my own family and the Kesslers. My father had lost his job as a ditch digger when construction work virtually stopped after the crash. The Kesslers owned a struggling grocery store and needed someone to run it. They took my parents in and allowed our family of five to live in one large room behind the store. Without the Kesslers, the Cuomos might not have made it. But together, both we and the Kesslers endured. I was born behind Kessler's grocery store in 1932, the year that another former New York governor ran for president and began to change America forever. Everywhere you go, everyone you meet, all they talk about is this depression. They blame it on the war, they blame it on Wall Street, on politics and this administration. For two years now we've been assured good times are on the way. I wonder how much longer we must hear them talk this way. Prosperity is just around the corner. What we'd like to know is which corner. We've turned so many corners now we're dizzy. But still I'm positive we'll soon be busy. Why, I read in Monday's paper where 10,000 men were hired. Yes, but Tuesday they forgot to say 12,000 more were fired. But I insist this land of ours is stable. Stable? Sounds like horses to me. It was the Depression and election year of 1932. In just three years, America had been rocked off its foundations. The stability and prosperity of the 20s were gone, replaced by fear and hunger. And you couldn't even get a legal glass of beer to take the edge off a world gone crazy. You might not have enough to eat, yet you saw farmers on the newsreels dumping milk because they couldn't afford to bring it to market. It was the rainy day you'd been saving your money for. But your money was suddenly all gone because the bank had closed its doors. In the words of a popular depression song, you can't go to the poorhouse because the beds have all filled up with millionaires and because the poorhouse was the White House now. The man in the White House wasn't hungry, but he was as fearful as any American of losing his job. Herbert Hoover was being personally blamed for the Great Depression. I was playing with a little girl on the Maypole rings and suddenly her mother came and snatched her away and said, you can't play with her. She's responsible for your father losing his job. He was an unlikely villain. The name Hoover had been synonymous with humanitarian. He had made his reputation during the Great War. For the starving nation of Belgium, caught between German trenches and a British blockade, Hoover orchestrated shipments of food. Hoover Kitchens, the relief stations were called. But he had no craving for fame and power. Hoover always claimed he was a public servant, not a politician. This rare home movie footage shows the real Hoover, a man who preferred fishing with his granddaughters to the trappings of wealth and power. Nevertheless, his humanitarian fame and progressive politics put him in demand. In 1928, he was the overwhelming choice to succeed Calvin Coolidge in the White House. Hoover assumed the office, but not the $75,000 a year salary. He never took one dime, one red cent as president. He turned it all back in the treasury because he had money. It was the height of the economic boom. Hoover appeared ready to preside over an unrivaled time of prosperity in America. In 
And yet he had personal misgivings about uncontrolled speculation on Wall Street. He liquidated most of his own stocks at the peak of the bull market. Hoover was one of the few to get out in time. There were other signs of distress in the land. Farming had been in a slump since the end of the Great War. In the cities, assembly lines were humming at substantial human cost. It was the age of the infamous speed up. Even the elite noticed a kind of spiritual bankruptcy in America. In his essay, The Jazz Age, F. Scott Fitzgerald told of the epidemic of suicide among his friends. The good life, it seemed, was not good enough to live for. Then came Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, Black Tuesday. The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. My mother gambled on the stock market, so she always asked me to call up saint Fal, which was the broker, and ask them for the quotation, the stock market quotations. So I called again that one afternoon, and I didn't remember from one day to the next what the quotations were, and I quoted the figures to her, and she faded dead away on the bed. When I arrived in New York after the crash, I found a city of very bewildered people. They were bewildered, they were frightened, and they were in shock. Some people thought the crash was an opportunity. Suddenly, stocks were cheap. Now is the time to buy. I hope you have plenty of the wherewithal to wade in and buy. But not long after Black Tuesday, many stocks were about as valuable as wallpaper. I remember looking with considerable interest at one room in the Chicago club where members took stocks that went to nothing and pasted them on the wall as a souvenir of the Depression. The demand for goods vanished. Assembly lines ground to a halt. And crops rotted in the field because they weren't worth the price of picking. In response to the emergency, President Hoover cut income taxes. It was little help when the tax on an average salary of $4,000 was less than $6 per year. But otherwise, he believed government should leave the economy alone. It would heal itself. Prosperity, he predicted, was just around the corner. That kind of advice had seen Americans through recessions for more than a hundred years, but this time they weren't buying it. Americans turned on the president with a vengeance. The town that I lived in was a Republican town, and even there you found a, a breakthrough of people getting disenchanted with President Hoover. It is one of the ironies, one of the tragedies, in fact, of Hoover's career, that this instinctively progressive man, who had a sense of government uh, as an intervening authority, although a limited, more limited sense than his successor, it's a, it's a real irony that he would be, Hoover would be perceived as a conservative reactionary president. Having identified a scapegoat, the country now set about adopting a hero. He would be everything that Herbert Hoover was not a Democrat, an aristocrat, a consummate politician. A role that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born to play. He had it, he had charm, charisma. He just caught on. I don't mean caught on like a movie star or a rock star of the day, no, 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 no. We don't experience any more politicians who catch on. Well, FDR caught on. In the fall of 1932, an intricate dance of a different kind was winding down, and it was plain to see who would drop by the wayside. Our party can truly feel that we have held the faith. 
Herbert Hoover had stood by his guns throughout the crisis. It was old time individualism, not the government, that would see the nation clear. Deficit spending was unthinkable, as was welfare, even if the people were hungry. Hoover didn't sugarcoat this bitter medicine. He didn't seem to mind if he was unpopular, as long as he was correct. He became an easy target for a master politician. It is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. But these toes belong to the comparative few. FDR had a very particular approach to politics, quite unique, very different from today's politicians and very different from most politicians before him. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed the game. He saw it as a game, played it as a game. You have nominated me. Unlike Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt did not write his own speeches, but the power of the voice behind the borrowed words was electrifying. During the four months between the election and the inauguration, the depression worsened, and the political differences between FDR and Hoover turned into bitter personal hostility. Hoover tried to draw Roosevelt into a cooperative effort to relieve the emergency, but the president-elect refused. He was saving his ammunition. Hoover ignored the convention of dining with the Roosevelts at the White House. He invited them to an afternoon tea instead. Feeling snubbed, FDR declined the invitation. By the time he exited the White House for the last time as president, Hoover was barely on speaking terms with Roosevelt. So when they rode from the White House to the Capitol, you get these photographs and this marvelous cartoon showing the smiling FDR, confident um, Hoover just as glum. I mean, you couldn't tell the difference between where his crumpled top hat was and his face began. An atmosphere of petty rancor on a bleak day in Washington that was punctuated by ringing words from the Capitol steps. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. This was probably one of the great statements and misstatements of all time. If he wanted to put it more accurately, he would have added, but there is a lot to fear. Nonetheless, the mood of the country was energized. Gone were the dismal days of government inertia. Herbert Hoover had once seemed destined for presidential greatness. He had remained the same, but the country had utterly changed. Now on the political sidelines, he had more time to spend fishing with his grandchildren. Hoover's naive political style was one of the casualties of the Depression. There was a new order in Washington, media savvy, opportunistic. Politics at its best, and, some say, it's worst. Some of America's innocence had been lost, but her political genius had been found. President Roosevelt had helped to banish the fear of hard times. It remained to be seen how he would lead the nation out of the Great Depression. I've often wondered what would have happened if during the Great Depression, Americans had decided that Hoover was right and FDR was wrong. If we had said, let's just wait this depression out. Americans are tough and individualistic and don't need the government's help. The federal government would have certainly been smaller today and many would say less intrusive. But it's also very possible that American democracy would have died that we would have succumbed to chaos, class warfare, and possibly a violent revolution. Americans made a different choice. They chose FDR four times.